Hello and welcome to Down to Earth, a podcast created by the environmental charity Hubbub. This season is all about fashion, because would you believe it, the fashion industry produces 10% of all carbon emissions and clothing production has roughly doubled since 2000. Alongside that, one garbage truck full of clothes is being burned or dumped in landfill every second. So we want to discover why we're buying so much and how our wardrobes impact the world around us. I'm Sarah Dival and I've been working in the environmental space for seven years, but I've always been a big shopper. I love fashion and I love new clothes, and however much I learn about what the fashion industry is up to, I still find fast fashion a hard habit to break. And I find it really difficult to know how to dress sustainably. I know I'm not alone in that feeling, so I want to bring you with me as we meet the designers, experts and change makers who unpick why our wardrobes aren't working for us and for the planet. Have you ever wondered what your clothes are actually made from? According to research by The Ethical Consumer, about two thirds of all textile fibres are synthetic and most of our clothes are made from oil based fibres like polyester. I'm really interested in finding out more about the fabrics that make up our clothes because changing the way we produce them can have a huge impact on the environment. Luckily, I know just the person to speak to. Dr. Michael Sheffer was born into a textiles family and now he's the project manager for sustainable textiles at Dutch University. And if anyone can answer our questions about why fabric is so important when we talk about sustainability, it's Dr. Sheffer. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here with you from the Netherlands. Are you zooming in all the way from the ne- Netherlands? Well, all the way. It's not so far. It's in Nijmegen, uh, in the war known as a bridge not too far, because this was the last bridge the, the British could take in the Battle of Arnhem. So today, I mean, this podcast, so it's all about sustainable fashion and we're looking from a different angle of sustainable fashion every week and we wanted to talk to you because... Um, I think fibre is something that people don't know a lot about. They don't know (laughs) what their clothes are made from, where those fibres come from. So I wanted to ask you why we should be thinking about fibre in what we're wearing or what we're eating. Um, What fibre is, why we should be thinking about it in terms of fashion. Well, we we have to think about fibres because almost all textiles are made from fibres. And the exception... You, if you, if you call leather or leather textile, leather is not really a fiber in a proper sense. And it's a long time ago that people wear steel. Middle Ages, people were doing that for battles, but uh, it's not that any more use. So f- fibers is 99.5 or, or percent of, of textiles. So it's important to look at. The second thing is that in terms of, of CO2 footprint, uh, the fiber component is substantial. And besides the electricity needed to to, to fuel uh, machines, um, it's fiber is the essential component. And, and why fiber is so important is, is that if, as a world, we want to be CO2 neutral by 2050, we should not use any longer any petroleum fossil-based fiber. So forget about the polyesters, forget about the polyamides. Uh, so that's about 75% of fibers we are now using can no longer be used in 30 years' time. How how have we got to a place where those kinds of fibers are so much of the market and so much of what we wear? It it mainly came because because the the big polyester manufacturers were able to design uh, yarns that were also comfortable so that in the shape of the fiber, uh, they also adopt, they also take up moisture. Um, It also helps that they are are easily elastic and you combine it with elastane, you have an elastic fiber. So the they also adhere closer to the body. Um, and uh, the price of polyester has declined by 16 times. They are 16 times cheaper now than they were in 1970. While cotton is more or less the same price, wool is slightly more expensive. Viscose has remained almost stable. So and also price-wise, they're much cheaper. And they're highly reliable. I mean, you, you pump out the petrol, you make naphtha, you make, you make polyester out of naphtha. You get everything every day the same quality. Whereas with with cotton, or with wool, or with linen, you're depending on the climate, on the weather, on um, well the, the skills of of workers to to have a, a constant quality. It's not so reliable. Polyester 
is easy to pump up and it's, it's highly reliable. Uh, not excellent, but but good enough for most consumers. And what are the problems that that's causing environmentally, the fact that we're using so many more oil-based fibres? And I guess also using more of all kinds of fibres because our clothing production has increased so dramatically. Yeah, it's two different things. So one thing is, why, why is, it, is it a problem to use synthetic fibers, polyester, polyamide? The first one is because at the end of their lifetime, uh, they they are built of CO2, which is not natural CO2. So so when you when you burn them or landfill them or even reuse them, they discharge CO2. So they add to the climate change. That's one thing. And the second thing is that uh, in use, so by using them, by wearing them, by washing them, especially, they they give out they give out microplastics that end up in the sewage system and ultimately in the in the rain in the in the in the rivers and in the sea. Whereas the natural fibers are more or less CO two neutral. They are, they absorb CO two when they grow, and they they release it also at the end of their lives. But it's 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 in a, it's it the cycle remains closed. And um, Cotton and linen and wool, they also shed microparticles, but they create, they're, they're biodegradable. What are the problems with trying to create more sustainable fabrics? Because it sounds like none of the ones that we're using at the moment are necessarily working for the environment in the way that we want them to. Is there going to be a, a new fabric that comes out or a different way of creating fabrics that are already in existence that work better for the environment? Well, one thing that should come back is, I have a bunch of hemp here. Uh, hemp has been a very popular, this is bleached hemp at home, so I did it myself. Uh, so hemp is one that can, can come back. It was a major fiber in the 19th century, but we've lost it more or less over the last 100 years. So that is one possibility. The other possibility is to use, I also have an example here. This is basically wood, shed, wood the, the woody parts of hemp, hemp and to make viscose. A viscose is also an artificial fiber, but made of wood. Or, and it can be made of straw and all kinds of agricultural residues. Uh, and we have on, in, on Earth around 3 billion tons of agricultural residues a year. So if we convert 3% of that into, into, into fibers, we have solved the, the problem. What happens if everyone goes, great, hemp's the one, let's make everything out of hemp, that's the sustainable fibre. Do we run into another problem again where we uh, we have a monoculture and we're only using one kind of fibre? Well, I mean, we have to reduce the fibre consumption and, and, and the we and our is basically Europe and the USA. Now, we, we buy something like 30 kilos a year. If we would have a behaviour of buying as much as people in middle-income countries do, like Mexico or Turkey, uh, 10 kilos a year, that would reduce the problem a lot. So we have to, to, to spend our money in a better way than we do now regarding fashion and textiles. So that's one thing. Um, because whatever combination we use, the world cannot sustain the fiber consumption of have 50 million tons. So the, the one is, is less is more, uh, so better better fiber production. Um, I think we have to, to keep cotton, but cotton must be much better cultivated than it does now. So there are good examples, but um, in a lot of countries, it uses too much water, poor working conditions. Um, and basically to improve cotton, we have to double the price. Uh, even if we double the price, cotton is cheaper than hemp. Uh, hemp is a, an, interest, an interesting crop for farmers. It's an interesting crop also in terms of properties like flax, but um, we are not used to produce it anymore. So we have to invest a lot, tens of millions of euros, tens of millions of pounds in, in, in scaling up the manufacturing of hemp fibers because we simply no, we have no longer the capacities. It's not very complicated. I mean, I've, I've been making some in my, in my kitchen, but that's of course, it's been, it took me hours to make a kilo, which is not affordable. Uh, we have to scale up the technology to 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 treat to process hemp. You mentioned that you had some examples of places where cotton was being made in a good way. Could you explain what those are? Where where is cotton being made well? Cotton can be a good crop, 
uh, provided that on the first place it's, it's only rain fed. So only the, the rainfall enables the growth of cotton. And that is the case, for example, in, in Africa. And most in Africa, in Brazil, it's a rain fed crop. If irrigation is needed, then the best irrigation is irrigation through the roots so that not, it not, doesn't evaporate, all the water is absorbed by the plant. That's, a, that's, let's say, an exception. What is also important with cotton is that the, the cotton growers and workers get a decent wage uh, because the main problem with cotton is that um, it's often family business and the kids work for, for nope, for nothing. So that's also an important condition. And the third one would basically to foster cotton with a, a stronger fiber, uh, a longer fiber, fiber that basically lasts longer. And that's a complicated one because to have a longer fiber, you need more pesticide or you need, be you need better pest control. Because basically when a pest, a bug goes into a cotton, it eats the fiber and makes it shorter. And a longer, a longer cotton can be uh, can have a longer life because it can be chemically and mechanically recycled. And that's important. And now most of the cotton is too short to recycle. And therefore, most cotton is blended with viscose or polyester. And polyester cotton viscose blend is awful to recycle. It's impossible to recycle. On using more pesticides and making a longer fiber, how much would that affect the health of the soil in places where those pesticides are used? Are you going to get a knock-on problem later down the line? I have to correct myself. We should not use more pesticides. We should use natural uh, natural methods of pest control by, by in introducing other animals. Yeah, so it's called regenerative agriculture. Um, and the other, which might help as well, cotton has become a, 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 an, an annual plant, uh, so, although it's a perennial. Uh, so maybe the impact on the environment is lower if it's a perennial plant. So you grow it, the plant grows up, keeps on the field, and you harvest it every year. Now we basically harvest the whole the whole plant and replant it. That's also having a poor impact. And I've heard the word regenerative farming used talking about food and farmers who are doing it in that way. I've never heard it in fashion before. And I wonder what the incentives would be for textile production to change in that way, where regenerative, regenerative farming becomes normal for cotton production, for linen production. Well, the, the 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 annoying thing is that for the textile short firms, there's no real benefit of having regenerative farming. It's also a topic. Let's say the the largest cotton using retailer only uses one percent of the world's production, so that's even tiny. However, there are growers who are working towards regenerative textiles. The 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 most advanced one is happens to have the same name as I have, the Sheffer Group in Brazil, and they work for PVH for Tommy Hilfiger, for example. So, and, and Tommy Hilfiger takes an interest in regenerative uh, agriculture, but it's really one of the exceptions. Few few retailers, few, few textile manufacturers have an interest. The other exception is the Turks. The Turkish industry also, because Turkey is integrated, so they have cotton cotton cultivation in Turkey, spinning, weaving, clothing making. So some Turkish brands also look at regenerative textiles. But it's rather exceptions than the rules. And that's because it's it's not well organized. Uh, there's no good organization of the cotton industry to, to really foster regenerative methods. And how do we change that? How do we, you know, if we want uh, an industry that's going to mean that our soil is healthier, that we have enough water, that People are being paid in our pack. We put pressure on industries to make those changes. Well, and the important thing is I, mean, I, I gave a, a set of lectures over the last three years about cotton and about the, the, the polyester and CO2 problems. And I gave some even on Sunday morning. People find it highly amusing and interesting and entertaining. And then they go for lunch. So, so it, it doesn't come home. It doesn't really get through them that in 30 years we have to get rid of polyester. And 30 years is, is, is quick because 30 years is around is about the lifetime of a factory. So so people in fashion don't realize, I mean, serious people don't realize the, the issue. And that's because fashion people have lost uh, the, materi the material touch, the, 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 the reality that, that there is agriculture. Um, and that's because it, it is disjointed. I mean, my, my grandfather had a flax mill 
and my other grandfather had a textile mill. They, they were 20 kilometers from each other. They realized that what the one was making was going to the other one. Nowadays, it's so globalized, people don't realize the interactions between them. Yeah, actually, in another interview that we've done with this podcast, which is coming out next week, we speak to Amy Powney, who runs a brand called Mother of Pearl in England, and she set out to create a completely sustainable collection. So she goes to the wool maker and she tries to find out where the wool comes from, and then she goes to the spinner and tries to find out what farm they're getting the wool from. And there really was no way for her to find out where all these different parts were coming from because it was going to nine different countries before the fabric even ended up at the factory where her clothes were being made so it seems like the process is just enormous and mystifying yeah yeah big it's because we have been chasing for lower costs and we've been chasing for scale so basically each each step of textiles is optimized to its necessities and then you get a very global t- skill i mean wool is it grows in grows on 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 sheep in australia the first processing now mainly in china then a part may go to Italy to spin and weave. Then the making up may be in Eastern Europe or Northern Africa. Um, so, so, so these chains have become quite long. Flax is very labor intensive. So there we have the reverse. We have flax that grows in Northern France. Then 95% of the ship to China to be spun over there. Part of it comes back as, wo- as wovens, part of shirts. So, so we have totally broken down the, the value chains. Um, basically to optimize the costs of each stage. Now, so so partly we should go back to what we had 100 years ago, clusters of, of manufacturers that are very close to each other. And so the times that the sheep were on the Yorkshire Hills, the spinners and weavers were in Bradford and Leeds, um, and, and the clothing makers were, well, Manchester, Manchester, Yorkshire as well. So, so partly we have to go back to that model. And how likely do you think it is that we can move away from this huge globalized model we already have where, you know, things are being sent to wherever the labor is cheapest? Do you think we'd ever get to a place where a textile industry comes back to places like the UK in a big way? Well, the UK is a tough nut, um, but Europe is feasible. And and the reason why I'm, I'm skeptical about the UK, the UK hasn't invested in vocational training for the last 60 years. So, you, so it simply lacks the skills of, of spinners, weavers, knitters dyers uh, that's gone the country has forgotten to invest um whereas in portugal in italy in some eastern european countries those skills are still there even france has kept more than than, than the uk so so let's abstract from the uk um it's i mean still still U- europe employs 1.6 million people in the textiles just that's not an anecdotal it's quite substantial it is half that it was 30 years ago but it's still 1.6 million um, but that's only about five percent of world production. Um, so, so I could imagine we could imagine a model that ten percent of world production is in Europe. It will never be fifty percent again, as as it was fifty years ago. That's a, that's unlikely. Um, but we are in a bit, we are in a better position than the US. US is like the UK; all skills are gone. Yeah, generationally, I think it's something that's just completely dropped out of of practice, and actually, a lot of the the places that I know that do produce in the UK, a lot of them are working with women's refugee groups. They're not women who were born in England. They're women who learned these skills, have moved over to England, so are bringing them with them rather than having learned them here. England, England I, I, I worked in the UK when I was young. My, my mother and father worked in the textile industry when they were young. My grandfather worked in the UK when he was young. Um, so, so up to the 1980s, England was a... Um, a seedbed of talent and, and a school to learn industrial skills, but that's gone. You got Brexit instead, and I think I think there's a link between those two. It's because because the UK lost its skills that people get, became angry and voted against the EU, but it, it doesn't solve anything. I mean, you if if the UK has a future in industry, it needs to invest massively in in, in skills, and I haven't seen any investment in the last five years. And what about those places where, you know, essentially work is just being sent out? It's a farm or a factory, the clothes or the fibre is being made there and then being sent to another country to be sold. I imagine it's unlikely that a lot of the, you know, con grows in Africa are going to end up wearing the clothes that eventually get produced. Well, there's, there's some things happening. Uh, let's say, of course, we have countries, you have countries like China, where basically they have fibre production, spinning, weaving, knitting and clothing making. 
However, at the end, clothing making is becoming too expensive in China. So Vietnam is picking up on, on the final stage of production. So you get a combination of Chinese fabrics made up in Vietnam or made up in the rest of Asia. It has always been difficult to industrialize in Africa, but there are some big investments going on in some countries to start spinning and weaving African cotton, especially for, let's say, less fashionable products like bed linen, uh, bath, bath towels, and so on, uh, kitchen linen, where basically it's it's a lot of fabric and uh, it's mainly white, or or you can dye it, or it is woven in, in Africa and dyed or printed in, in Europe to be more fashionable. So th that's there is there is something happening in, in Africa that was not happening well until ten years ago. And can you talk a little bit? You mentioned microplastics, and I wonder what the damage of these fibers breaking down actually is. And I'm thinking of all the clothes that we know get dumped in the Atacama Desert, all the clothes that we know uh, end up probably in the bin and might break down into microplastics, end up in the ocean. What kind of issues are they causing? It's important to, 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 to be more specific here. Not all polyester discharge the same level of microplastics. So the way it's spun, the, the way the fiber is made, the way it's spun, the way it's knitted or woven, already matters. Uh, so a closely knit uh, polyester doesn't shed as much microplastics than a fleece uh, uh, jumper. Uh, so that's one difference. Um, you can control your process better. So let's say high engineered polyester plant will design or make yarns that, or fibers that, that, that shed off less microplastics than, than poorly made polyester. So there are differences. The way, the way of making it better and there's also a way to reduce it by having the garments pre-washed, so that they're washed pre-washed industrially. So basically, and if you wash industrially, it's always uh, absorbed. Let's say in a in a water, if what it should be absorbed in a water treatment plant. Uh, that also may also help, and it also helps if we if we fit all our washing machines at home with a filter. And that would reduce the microplastic load a lot. Um, so that is one side to it. To be very blunt, uh, the, the reason why best, uh, textiles end up in deserts is because in some countries of the world, the recycling business is not well organized. That's simply the reason. Because if you if you discard clothing as a retailer or as a city, you can either, it, it depends how you tender the collection of the waste. And basically, in the Netherlands, most cities tender it out to specialists that basically sort all the textiles and the poorest part is burnt. It's not good, but it's burned and you recover energy. And you have, let's say, the lower cost one, basically they buy the old stuff and then they bring it to Africa and they start sorting there. And then they take the best out and bring it back to Europe and the rest re remains there and they discharge in the desert because it's the cheapest solution. So it's not, a, it's not a fundamental problem. It's basically poor organization or shitty, shitty entrepreneurship and lazy and lazy public authorities in terms of, of tendering the waste. So that's a, that's an organizational issue. Um, however, if better organized, as most textiles have no value secondhand and the fibers are blended, they burn, they will be burnt. And burned basically means that, well, at best we, we, we re recover energy. But in a country like the Netherlands, we don't have any landscaping anymore. Uh, we hardly have any public authority that sends us the stuff to Africa. So it's all getting burned. Um, yeah, because it's too poor to. It has it, the fibers too short. There are too many blends. It's it's uh, the worth, the value of of reusing or reselling or recycling is too low. And I have a question about recycling. Actually, we haven't talked about it, but how has fabric recycling moved on? I know that uh, the last time that I heard you speak, you just touched on fabric recycling, and it's a really difficult thing to do because. A lot of fibers are mixed. A lot of things are really bad quality. It's not always easy to recover it, but I assume that we can't just keep using virgin fibers to keep making clothes. Well, a lot of retailers and brands realize they have to change. So one of the big topics now is what people call mono, mono fiber or monopolymer uh, materials. So, so there is a, a feel that, uh, that we should stop blending or, or at least stop blending without thinking about it. So that's something that has been changing over the last years. Um, 
larger retailers, larger brands lead, lead the way. Uh, some take um, well, easy easy solutions, like, and the idea of, of, of recycling PET bottles into, into textiles is not very clever because a, a bottle is easily recyclable. Once you made a, a jacket out of it, a jacket is, is tougher to recycle. So it's not always clever, but at least people, let's say retailers, try to do their best. Um, so that's that's moving on. Um, the problem was that we have so much demand that basically there's a lot of poor cotton, poor bad cotton and bad polyester getting on the market. Um, so that's why we should consume less, uh, and impose higher standards on 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 cotton quality and polyester quality. And do you think we're going to see more recycling in the coming decades? Do you think it's going to be more common that you give your jumper to somebody and it gets recycled and turns something new? Yeah, there will be more recycling simply for, I mean, in Europe, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of the UK. In Europe, um, there's comp there's going to be compulsory separate collection of textiles by 2025 that will help. I, I don't know how it is in the UK. Um, so we expect a lot of, and we expect by 2030, a ban on exporting waste, textile waste. So so that means that by 2030, we, we should be able to recycle 9 million tons of textiles a year. That's only nine uh, is about eight percent of world product, world consumption. Okay, so so I yeah it is going to expand, um, but but as some people expect huge expansion, but to be realistic, on a global basis, it's a huge feast a feat if we have attained 10, 15 million tons of, of recycling by two thousand thirty, and that's only fifteen percent. Then now it's around one. So, so yes, it will go from 1 to 15. It will have to go to 80% by 2030 or even by 2040. I guess you would hope that what's going to happen is consumption will come down as recycling comes up and we reach some kind of equilibrium. Well, that's not even realistic. Realistic would be that we are able to stabilize consumption at 110 million tons. The recycling will go up. Biobase will go up as well. And basically... Um, the growth of consumption in developing countries will be matched by a decline of consumption in the richer countries. Uh, and in general, we will promote reuse and recycling. Yeah. So it's with all of all of all of the above. Everything coming together. Yeah. And what do you think of I mean, there are a lot of there's a lot of buzz about new new cool fibers. I'm thinking about like I see a lot about tensile, I see a lot about mushroom leather, lots of things being made from materials that people might not expect to be made from. Do you think that's going to become more common as well, that we see more of those kinds of fibers? Well, you, we will certainly see more of 10 cell like fibers, uh, called live cell. Uh, their production has doubled over the last 10 years. It's very likely to double as well. And doubling 10 cell or live cell is hundreds of thousands of tons. If we double mushroom, uh, it's tens of tons. And that's tiny. Um, Mushroom is an interesting product, but it's not a replacement for leather. Because leather is animals living for four or five years with winter, summer, uh, so they, they get strong over time. Mushroom is made in, 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 in weeks. So it's not the same, it's not replacing it. And le leather shoes, they can live for 10, you can use them for 10 or 20 years. And mushroom shoes, in one or two years, they are, they are um, spoiled. So, so yes, there will be alternatives. But the, the most fancy alternative is yet tiny in terms of size of, of initiatives. Um, so I, I expect you will need scale to fight polyester. You need scale. So I expect a lot of, of bio-based polyesters, um, but I don't expect a lot from um, from all these small, tiny initiatives because very few of them are picked up by, by, by big capital. And my final question that we ask all of our guests is, what do you think the biggest changes that the industry could make tomorrow to build a more sustainable fashion industry? And what do you think one thing that people listening at home can do? Well, the first one, of course, is don't buy something new unless you really need it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, the first thing, the second thing you could do, don't buy blends. And buy pure wool, buy pure cotton, buy pure polyester, even polyester, but don't buy blends because any blend is is difficult to 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 recycle so that's the second thing i would advise if you if people buy cotton let them buy better cotton or let's say a got a cotton with a a trademark with a, a green trademark there are several ones of them um 
I also advise, I try to buy all the only European. So made in Italy, made in France, but that's an expensive choice. So it doesn't come cheap. Um, and then the quality is slightly better than made in Asia because there is, a, there is still in Europe a culture of quality that, that helps as well. So always look at the label and all the large retail brands have a label with made in because a lot of non-EU countries ask for it. So if, so that's always worthwhile to look at. Well, the, the other is always bring, bring back the clothing you don't want either to a thrift shop or to a charity or put it, if it's in your, in your city, put it in, in a separate waste collector. So basically it's going to be reused. N don't, never throw it in the, in the kitchen bag. And what about the industry? What could they do tomorrow to make the biggest change? The, f the, the best thing the industry could do is to stop designing products with blended fibers. Easy. Uh, yeah, it's not so easy because it costs them money. A lot of blends are made because it makes it. A lot of blends are used because it's cheaper than pure. A pure wool is more expensive than wool with polyamide. So, so fabric manufacturers are very clever in combining uh, fibers in order to have the same look at lower price. And that's the end of my chat with Dr. Michael Sheffer. I hope that you enjoyed it. I really liked his tip of trying to choose unmixed fabrics where you can rather than mixed ones. So buying 100% cotton or 100% polyester, uh, because while obviously we should be wearing our clothes for as long as we can and extending our lives, when that thing does come to the end of its life, it will make it so much easier to recycle. And I also think it's a really good habit to get into just to check the label whenever you're buying something so you know what it's made from, you know where it's been produced, you know how to wash it. And maybe that's something we can all do when we buy something new. If you want some more tips on how to live sustainably at home, then go and follow us at Hubbub on Instagram, on TikTok or on Twitter. Or if you feel like it, you can even email into the show. Our email is hello at hubbub.org.uk. And if you're quick enough, I might read it out on next week's programme. This show was presented by me, Sarah Dival, and produced by Ellie Jane.